Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the second keynote presentation in our inaugural Precision Medicine event. Uh, you're about to hear from Kathy Hudson from the NIH uh, discussing the Precision Medicine Initiative, and I'll give Kathy a full and proper introduction in just a couple of minutes. So hello again, I'm Kevin Davis, uh, the publisher of CNEN, Chemical and Engineering News, uh, published by the American Chemical Society, and one of the co-organizers, uh, along with LabRoots, uh, of this inaugural and exciting Precision Medicine in, uh, uh, conference. Uh, today's uh, web seminar is presented and hosted by LabRoots, our partners. Uh, they're the leading social networking website and a provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. Uh, my organization, the CNN Media Group, is the official media partner for today's event, and we're delighted to have uh, partnered with LabRoots to co-organize and help uh, uh, plan the agenda. Uh, Kathy Hudson may be our second keynote today following a scintillating presentation from Eric Schatt just uh, a moment ago, uh, but she was uh, literally the first name on our agenda when we started planning this uh, event uh, uh, several months ago, so we, we can't wait to, uh, to bring her on. A couple of housekeeping notes uh, before we welcome Kathy. Uh, the webcast is designed to be interactive. We look forward to taking your questions, uh, which you can uh, enter in the Q&A box uh, at any time during Kathy's presentation and uh, we'll try to get to as many of those as we possibly can. Uh, so just click on the, the button, the Q&A button, in the lower left-hand side of your screen and, uh, and fire away. Uh, you can uh, enlarge the uh, slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the window. And if you encounter any technical issues uh, during the broadcast, uh, please hit the support button top right of your screen and, uh, and uh, follow instructions there. Uh, this is an educational webinar, and we're offering continuing education credits. Uh, so after the webinar is over, if you're interested in receiving credit uh, for your attendance, uh, please click on the CE button located bottom left-hand corner of the webpage and follow uh, the process for obtaining your, your credits. Um, we're required, because this is a CE event, to, to disclose any, disclose any uh, potential uh, uh, conflicts of interest. I will disclose that I'm on the scientific advisory board of uh, Pathway Genomics uh, and on the speakers bureau for the Harry Walker Agency, but uh, neither constitutes such a conflict. And Kathy has no uh, relevant financial relationships or conflicts to declare. So we got that out of the way. So it, it gives me a real pleasure to introduce and welcome uh, Kathy Hudson, who I've known for a long, long time and admire greatly. She's the deputy director for science outreach and policy for the NIH and serves as a senior advisor to NIH director. Director Francis Collins. She's leading the planning and creation of President Obama's Precision Medicine Initiative cohort program, having previously been a key architect of the NIH, excuse me, of the NIH Brain Initiative. Kathy's previously served as NIH Chief of Staff, held senior leadership roles at NCATS, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, as well as a NHGRI, and she's the founding director of the Genetics and Public Policy Center at Johns Hopkins, John Hopkins uh, University. So, uh, Kathy, without further ado, we want to thank you again for making time in your hectic schedule uh, to join us today, and uh, really look forward to your update and thoughts on the uh, Precision Medicine Initiative. So over to you. And uh, thank you, Kevin. And, uh, th thank you for that introduction. Um, Kevin, it's nice to see you, albeit in a small box uh, on my screen. So I am going to talk a little bit about the Precision Medicine Initiative, and it's great to follow Eric. I didn't get to watch Eric this morning, but uh, certainly know him and his work, and I trust that he provided a great um, set of insights about the promise of pre precision medicine in general. And so what I should say um, to sort of get started here is that I'm going to be talking about the Precision Medicine Initiative as announced by the President a little over a year ago. And specifically, I'm going to talk about the Precision Medicine Initiative cohort program. So the cohort program is one part of the initiative, and the initiative is one part of a bigger landscape um, surrounding uh, precision medicine and precision medicine advances. Uh, please note I, uh, I, I'm on Twitter and I tend to tweet almost exclusively about precision medicine and there's going to be a lot of things happening um, over the next 24 hours actually in precision medicine so I encourage you to, um, to follow me and you'll get updates that way. So by way of background I'm going to try to get my slide to advance. There we go. Um, so a little over a year ago, the President in the State of the Union address on January 20th and then 10 days later at the White House, 
announced that he was uh, launching this precision medicine initiative. And at that time, we didn't have a lot of clarity about exactly what this initiative would entail. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what we did in order to put together a really specific scientific blueprint for this initiative. Um, but clearly, uh, his enthusiasm in the State of the Union um, was received. Nearly every member of the House and Senate present there at the State of the Union uh, stood up and applauded together. And of course, that's a, a rarity. And then 10 days later, he invited uh, a large number of patients and researchers and others uh, to the White House to talk about this exciting initiative. So the broad overarching mission for the Precision Medicine Initiative is here, uh, really to usher in a new era of medicine in which uh, the uh, prevention, diagnostics, and treatment are tailored to an individual, not just their genes, but their lifestyle, environment, uh, and the like. So um, one question um, that we ask ourselves and we get asked about the Precision Medicine Initiative, which I'll talk about, is why now? Why did we pick this particular moment to launch this initiative? And the, the reasons are really multifold, uh, and they have a lot to do with um, the alignment of both technological advances and uh, culture, changes in culture that really make this the right time to uh, launch this initiative. My boss, Francis Collins, about a decade ago published a paper, I think it was in Nature, in which he said, now is the time to have uh, a gene and environment cohort to really understand uh, how uh, gene by environment interactions influence health and disease. And he was flatly wrong because that was not the time. Sequencing was too expensive. We didn't have the kinds of technologies that we have today. And importantly, we didn't have the, the right set of relationships and um, to manage having participants as true partners in the research enterprise. So today we have engaged participants who are impatient to see advances. We have electronic health records, uh, which certainly didn't exist a decade ago and are improving uh, with uh, every day and every week. We have mobile technologies that allow us to monitor and others to monitor um, our whereabouts, our uh, activity level, um, various sorts of uh, biological measures, and those certainly are advancing rapidly. Um, and then, of course, we have genomic information and the cost of sequencing continuing to uh, plummet and making that more and more affordable and more and more integrated into uh, healthcare. And then we have um, big data and data science and the ability to uh, have an interconnected uh, world in which scientific data can be retrieved and made available uh, to researchers basically anywhere in the world uh, promptly. So that enables us then to build on uh, those technologies and an ecosystem that's really going to have to work closely together to make this initiative work. And that means uh, that includes the participants themselves, uh, people who want to share information about themselves to advance research and advance health and medicine. We need um, researchers, the government, uh, community leaders, and healthcare providers all to be working together to make this uh, initiative work. So the initiative in general is intended to um, enroll a large number of people from across the United States to agree to provide their information uh, for research purposes. And in order to lay out the scientific plan and what would really be required to put together this cohort, um, Dr. Collins put together a working group, which I had the honor of co-chairing with some colleagues. Um, and that group met over a period of a number of months, had many uh, workshops on specific topics, which are listed here on this slide. And um, those uh, workshops actually are uh, webcast and are archived, and you can get them from the Precision Medicine Initiative webpage at NIH. We also put out several requests for information on specific topics. And during the midst of our work, we did a survey in conjunction with the Foundation for the NIH in order to understand preliminarily, there's much more to know, about what are the public's attitudes about should we create such a cohort? Um, would they participate in such a cohort? What would be their aspirations and their concerns? So. Um, 
that working group generated its report just in September of 2015, and since then we pivoted very quickly from a planning mode to an implementation mode. I'm going to talk a little bit about both the recommendations of the working group and then what we are uh, doing in real time uh, today um, in implementing this, this plan. <clears throat> so one of the first things we did in the working group was to really explore what are the scientific opportunities that would be made possible by having a research cohort of a million or more people from across the United States, what questions could we uniquely ask and answer in such a research cohort? And that's important uh, in order to focus uh, on uh, obtaining the right data, focusing on high value uh, data that's going to be, enable us to answer these questions. So some of these examples are uh, listed here. Um, I'm particularly um, focused on being able to make sure that we always keep front and center being able to ask and answer questions in the short term, the medium term, and the longer term that are going to return value for the research community, community, but more importantly, for the individual participants in the cohort. And so um, I uh, particularly like the second example here about being able to uh, obtain and return to cohort participants the genetic variants that are responsible for uh, drug response. So I won't read through these, these uh, specific opportunities. You can see them here. So what's the cohort gonna, gonna, going to look like? A cohort, um, some people objected to using the word cohort when we first got started, uh, but it seems like it has stuck. A cohort, while used mostly in the scientific community, just basically means a group of people with a shared experience. And really, that's what we're looking for here, is a group of people from across uh, America who are going to have a shared experience together in collaborating uh, with researchers um, on this enterprise. So we hope to uh, have one million or more volunteers that will be broadly reflective of the diversity of the United States. It will not be statistically or epidemiologically uh, representative. We've tried that before and have found that it, the juice is not worth the squeeze uh, there in terms of cost uh, and scientific meaning. Um, we have a strong focus on underrepresented groups and really look to the, the development of this cohort as providing a research infrastructure that will really help us tackle um, health disparities in a much more effective way than has previously been possible. This is going to be a longitudinal cohort, so we're going to have an ongoing partnership with our participants. Um, and then we're going to have two methods of enrollment, one through healthcare provider organizations, which is more familiar to us uh, than um, the other, which I'll talk about in just a second. And we have put out solicitations for uh, these healthcare provider organizations, have received uh, applications, and we'll be making those awards in June. And I'll show you a timeline in a little bit. Also included in healthcare provider organizations are um, federally qualified health centers. And so we are really excited to be able to partner with community health centers who provide health care to the most uh, vulnerable uh, amongst us and really have an overrepresentation of underrepresented individuals and groups as among their patients. We have never uh, had a um, partnership with federally qualified health centers to do research at this scale before, so this is a, a really interesting and challenging opportunity. We're excited to get started uh, with that. Um, and then we want to make sure that there is, uh, and I'll come back to this repeatedly, substantial participant engagement at every stage, and that included in the working group process. So initially, within this cohort, we want to have a core data set. The data set will be um, collected and stored centrally um, and uh, made available in real time for research purposes. We want to make sure that, where possible, the data that we collect actually is comparable to data that others have collected. So think the UK Biobank, the Million Veterans Program, and other uh, uh, similar studies across the globe. We want to be able to, uh, where possible, use existing data standards and data models uh, wherever possible. And we want to start with a small but extraordinarily valuable data set and then add on as the cohort evolves and emerges uh, in partnership with our participants that we can add on additional uh, data sets over time. We don't want to be 
um, all things to all people at the get-go, we, we're likely to uh, collapse under our own weight if we do that. So we want self-reported measures, uh, what we're now calling participant uh, provided information, um, and that will be uh, among amongst the first data set that we collect, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we want to get a baseline health exam, and for people who are participating through healthcare providers, that will be easy. Um, I wonder if I can go backwards. I can go backwards. Um, so uh, I sort of skipped over in the methods of enrollment the direct volunteers. So I talked about the healthcare providers, the federally qualified health centers, but I didn't say that we really have an ambition to enable any person anywhere in the United States to be able to raise their hand and say, I want to participate in this cohort. Um, in fact, during the State of the Union, my mom, uh, 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 for in, who lives in St. Paul and is, uh, has a number of chronic conditions, but including rheumatoid arthritis, typed with a stylus on her iPad an um, email message to me during the State of the Union saying that she wants to join this cohort. So we have to make a way for anybody to be able to participate, not just because of my mom, but because it's the right thing to do. And that is going to be a distinct challenge and something we've never really tried to do before. So uh, as a part of building this cohort, we have some core values. Uh, one is that the cohort is open to anyone who is interested, that we want to reflect the rich diversity of uh, the United States, that we want participants as partners in all phases of the program. We want to make sure that data is available and data sharing is really the legacy of the Genome Project where it was our ambition then uh, to make sure that any researcher anywhere with an internet connection could get the genome sequence. Uh, we have the same ambition here, but we're um, also including participants as individuals who should have access to study information. And that is certainly not the case for um, much of the research uh, that we do. We do the research, we collect the biospecimens, we uh, learn new things, but we don't often uh, intentionally return all that information back to participants. So um, in collecting this information, we need to make sure that we have the right kind of data security and privacy principles in place. Um, the White House uh, has developed uh, privacy principles and uh, tomorrow we'll probably be announcing draft security uh, principles as well that are really key to this. The other thing that has been uh, particularly interesting along the way as we've designed this program is that the core values here and the core policies that we need to have in place to make this program work really are leading the way for the kinds of policies that we need to have in place for other biomedical research programs as well. And um, respect for research participants is really at the core, and I'm going to do a little um, digression here and say a word about um, how uh, Dr. Collins, who's pictured here, and I really got um, sort of um, inspired to think about research participants truly as partners, and that was through our work with the family of Henrietta Lacks. And you all may remember that the sequence of the HeLa cells was um, deciphered and published on a, a publicly accessible website and mirrored by our own uh, NCBI. And that took the family by surprise, and there was quite the stir in the Twitter sphere about that. And we ended up working with the family over a period of time uh, to make that sequence available, but also to bring them into the de decision-making process. And so this uh, picture of me taking a picture of Francis taking a selfie of himself with two of the Lex, Henry and Lex grandchildren, uh, Jerry and David and their mom, um, uh, was on the day that we announced this new partnership. And uh, they've really been inspirational to us in designing uh, the Precision Medicine Initiative. <clears throat> I mentioned that there had been a survey of public opinion and uh, a summary of some of the key findings is here. We're hoping to have this published uh, soon and make the full data set available as well. Um, but what you can see is that overwhelmingly people think that the cohort probably or definitely should be done. And then a slim uh, majority say that they would probably or definitely participate in a cohort. And of course that doesn't mean uh, what people say they'll do and what they actually do doesn't always align, um, but that's a good indicator. Most interesting was that uh, when asked about a whole series of potential motivations for participa 
participation, the, the number one reason that people uh, indicated they wanted to participate is to receive results and information from the study. So I'm going to skip this slide. So our goal is to have uh, information flowing through the healthcare provider um, partnered volunteers, the people in green here, and through our direct volunteers, the people in blue, and that they would provide this core initial data set uh, into a central biorepository, and we have applications in uh, now to from folks who are eager to help us build that biorepository, and um, data will be provided into a secure um, enclave that will be available for researchers, and of course over time that data set will grow. Um, just a word about the biospecimens um, and the biobank. Um, we want to make sure that people provide adequate consent for future uses of those biospecimens. We're going to start with blood, but we'll probably uh, uh, grow to have other kinds of biospecimens over time. And uh, we'll make sure that that is compliant with all of the necessary rules and regulations so that results from analysis of those specimens can be returned to the individual research participants. So while we're going to start uh, with that limited data set over time, we think that that can grow and some of the potential um, additional kinds of data that we might be able to add on are listed here. Um, we have um, solicited for and received applications for participant technology, a participant technology center, and that will, that center's job will be to help us in identifying and validating uh, and uh, deploying mobile health and other kinds of sensors um, in the cohort and being able to use those kinds of data uh, as well. And so that's an exciting, um, an exciting uh, aspect. So I mentioned the data flow out. Uh, data will be flowing uh, both out for research, and those research results will flow back in, and uh, information will be flowing to the participants themselves. And over time, that set of data will grow. I talked about returning uh, results to individuals, and we really want to be able to let people set their own preferences about what they want. So some people want everything, and they want to know everything. I am not a data lover myself, so uh, I would only probably want information when I want to go seek it myself rather than being pinged with information all the time. Um, others want to know uh, everything in real time, and we'll let people set their own preferences about that. I mentioned um, how this is a catalyst for policy advances and uh, have been really pleased in being able to work really hard on advancing some of these policies. So one uh, policy is, and I, I'm sure uh, for researchers who are listening, the frustration of participating in a multi-site study and having to wait for multiple different IRBs to provide back their often inconsistent views about your research protocol and your informed consent. Uh, instruments uh, can really delay research, and we are moving broadly to try to remove that as a barrier. So we have put forward a policy that we will require a single IRB for multi-site studies uh, funded by the NIH. We'll be finalizing that policy this spring, but for the Precision Medicine Initiative, we have already uh, put together a single IRB, and we'll be announcing the members of that IRB tomorrow. Um, we have to have good, strong privacy and security principles. I mentioned that those are going to also be um, uh, made public tomorrow, the security principles. We need to make sure that we can share results back to individuals, and that requires that we have some alignment between um, CLIA requirements, clinical laboratory improvement amendments, and HIPAA requirements, and we're working very hard on that. And then we're also going to have to address the issues of if we're really going to allow and encourage everyone from all life's stages and ages to participate, we're going to have to figure out how to um, uh, really robustly include families and children, people who are or become to decisionally impaired um, uh, during the course of the study, and um, participants who may become incarcerated during the course of the cohort. So um, we have also, in keeping with our notion of participants as partners, we will have participants involved in all aspects of the PMI cohort program governance, 
and uh, a, um, a snapshot of that is here. We are actively um, in the process of trying to hire a PMI program uh, director, and we hope to have that person in place uh, very shortly. And most of these advisory groups have already been established, and they are uh, comprised of uh, a third to a half uh, people who are either prospective participant or participant representatives. So our timeline here has been quite rapid and unusually rapid for the federal government, I must say. So in January uh, last, the president launched this initiative. We put together our working group. We got the recommendations. We put out um, funding opportunity announcements. Uh, we got the uh, applications in for all of those. And um, we are going to make tomorrow an announcement of our first awards. So our timeline up until December of 2016, and that's an important date for some of us, um, <clears throat> it's certainly an important date for the president whose initiative, who launched this initiative. And so we hope by December of, 20, of this year to have 79,000 individuals enrolled in the cohort program. I'm going to skip over that. So I want to talk a little bit about this first phase and the steps that we are taking to um, figure out, really, to experiment in how to invite people to participate and how to keep them engaged. And certainly this is not a new issue. It's a, an old issue. Um, but we don't do such a good job of this in biomedical research. We don't do a great job of uh, what we say recruiting, probably not the best word, uh, recruiting people into clinical trials. Um, in fact, we uh, suck at it. And so we want to learn through this uh, cohort program how to do that better and how to have a true partnership. I'm going to speed along here because I see that it is almost 1230 and we want to have ample time for questions. So I'm going to zip along a little bit here. Um, and say that we did put out um, these funding announcements and um, they were both for a engagement effort and a direct volunteer effort. And I want to say just a word about the direct volunteer pilot because that's really critical. We need to figure out how to set up a portal where anybody in the United States, including my mom, importantly, can um, access information about the cohort sign up to be in the cohort, provide their informed consent, um, and provide information over the course of time and get information back. And that's a significant challenge. And um, uh, I'm going to skip along here a little bit and talk about the direct volunteer uh, pilot. So um, we will be tomorrow announcing this first award for a direct volunteer pilot studies. And this is really to develop this participant interface to optimize ways to, to get people engaged and to keep them engaged over the long haul. And so we're really excited to have um, been able to put out the solicitation for this opportunity. Get, we got really exciting applications in with all sorts of interesting partnerships and we'll be making uh, that first award uh, tomorrow and we're using a non-traditional way to make that. When we first announced these funding opportunities, when was it? It was in November. We got the applications in in December. We reviewed them in January and we're making the award in February. That's breathtaking pace for us. Um, when I was announcing that at a conference in San Francisco, uh, Atul Butte was in the audience and he tweeted, um, why so fast? Um, and I uh, tweeted later um, that the president was impatient, and we are too. So I actually think we're s sort of um, setting the stage for being able to do things in a more rapid, more flexible, more nimble way uh, here at NIH. I'm excited about that. And we are also going to be announcing tomorrow our pilots with the federally qualified health centers. Um, really awesomely exciting. And then in June and July, we will be making announcements of uh, coordinating centers, which have huge task as a part of the Precision Medicine Initiative, some of those key functions listed here. Um, we will also be uh, announcing in June and July the healthcare provider organizations. We hope to name between five and seven of these as our partners and bringing in their patient populations and their communities to be um, volunteers in the cohort. 
and then the Participant Technology Center uh, and Biobank, which are going to be key to the infrastructure for the biospecimens and for developing and um, deploying mobile health technologies and sensors. So this is our general and general our timeline for moving forward with these activities. Uh, it's pretty exciting. The direct volunteer pilot launching uh, tomorrow, and then over uh, the period of the next uh, months through December, being able to enroll these 79,000 people initially with modest data set, but that data set will grow over time, and we think that data will be um, valuable in real time uh, this year uh, for researchers, but principally for asking important questions about how to engage and partner with uh, research participants. So this is a snapshot of things um, that we hope to have done over the course of uh, the next several months. Um, we want to have the direct volunteer engagement and enrollment pilot completed. We want to be able to use those results to design and launch the scale up of the direct volunteer program. We want to have strong partnerships with five to seven healthcare provider organizations. Um, we will have implemented and tested um, this exciting partnership with federally qualified health centers. We'll have um, our first set, our pioneer participants in the cohort, enrolled. Um, and we hope to have biospecimens collected and um, start to have some real ability for direct volunteers specifically to be able to obtain and then to direct to research, including PMI research, um, the contents of their electronic health records. And we're going to be announcing tomorrow a pilot award that we're making, uh, which we call Sync for Science, um, which would enable participants who have electronic health records to be able to access the information from their EHR and then to point it uh, to, to a research program, including to PMI. Um, and then by the end of the year, we'll have a functioning data platform um, that will have awesome security and um, awesome data access, both at the same time, and that we hope to have a number of research studies using these data already underway. So that is in a snapshot um, what we have managed to do so far and what we're hoping to do. I will conclude by saying that it is on the President's publicly available schedule that he is having an event about precision medicine tomorrow. It's going to be webcast <clears throat> live um, from the White House between 10 and 12. Uh, it promises to be an ex extraordinarily exciting um, morning and, in fact, day. And uh, we're going to have a party in the afternoon after all the announcements have been made. And so please uh, check that out. I'm not exactly sure what the URL is for that, but if you follow me, um, I will tweet that uh, URL out as soon as I get it. So with that, Kevin, I am going to, I think, throw this back to you. Or not. <laughs> Uh, Kathy, hi. Uh, uh, thank you so much. What a fantastic uh, uh, keynote presentation. And yes, we have plenty of questions to get to, so I hope you can stick around for another 10 minutes or so. Um, I thought you were going to invite us all to the party tomorrow, so maybe we'll look for that invitation on Twitter uh, as well. Uh, we, we can hope. Um, uh, so, yes, we have a, 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 a dozen or so questions, at least, from the audience, and I want to get to them uh, straight away. Uh, <coughs> firstly, I want to thank uh, Patricia Sebald uh, from the Booth Bay Region Health and Wellness Foundation up in Maine, I believe, uh, for a fusillade of questions, which I will quickly rattle through. Um, and uh, you, won't, you may need a pen and paper here, Kathy, to catch all these. But it's basically uh, a series. She's probing uh, what patients will uh, uh, have access to. So among her, her uh, great questions are, will patients have access to the analysis of their personal genomes? Understandable explanations of what the analysis reveals? Uh, will they know what subgroup of patients they have been clustered with? Uh, will they be able to add and share additional clinical or lifestyle uh, information to, uh, uh, to improve uh, the, the, the health records and make it easier for researchers uh, using data analysis to spot new patterns? Uh, will they be notified when a new finding arises uh, that impacts people in their genotype or phenotype? And will they be able to connect 
uh, with other patients who share uh, similar genetic traits and diseases. Let me leave it there and pass it back to you. So I am waiting to be connected. I hope I'm live. Okay. Um, so I'm going to try to answer. I'm going to try to answer that question um, by talking a little bit about the genomics component because I think this is really important. So first, um, the precision medicine cohort is about more than genes, and certainly more than genes um, play an important role in our health and um, and and uh, well-being. So the cohort program is going to collect wide uh, variety of data, much more broadly than genomics. We um, really would like, and given my background and given Francis's background, we're eager to be able to do genomics within the cohort. But we also understand that because we are anticipating giving that data back, that we have to do that with extraordinary intentionality. So. The issue of return of results has been one that has been debated and discussed for uh, over a decade. And we don't have, <clears throat> frankly, a perfect answer to what data should be returned and how should it be returned and what will people do with it. But I think that our general premise is that um, people can make uh, informed decisions about what to do with information and that if we have the data, they have a right to it. So that's sort of the starting platform. <clears throat> but it also means that we want to, um, that's probably not the first thing we're going to do out of the box, frankly. So we're not going to do uh, whole genome sequencing as the first set of analysis. Um, and that when we do the first set of genomic analysis, we want to have it something that can provide value to everyone. And that means providing value to the participants themselves. So I mentioned the pharmacogenetic markers as being particularly attractive and something that would be uh, useful both for the participants but also for us because a lot of these uh, variants could be more broadly uh, validated in a bigger uh, population and new variants uh, identified. So um, in terms of will we do whole genome sequencing, yes, but not out of the uh, starting gate. And uh, now I've, of course, uh, uh, quickly lost what the rest of the questions were, so I'm going to toss it, Kevin, back to you and say uh, that I at least answered part of one question. Let me just, thank you, Kathy. Let me just uh, uh, re repeat one of the other elements of the question, which I think is interesting, is will there be any sort of social networking or contact between participants? I think perhaps the questioner is alluding to the likes of patients like me, where you can sort of identify and spot and perhaps even correspond with people who are in the same boat as you, whether genotypically or phenotypically. Back to you. So I anticipate that there will be an extraordinarily rich social network or networks that are built as we begin this. And I think that's going to be one of the interesting things that we can explore with the direct volunteer pilots is um, people's interest in participating in such a network. And then as we build the cohort, actually doing some experimentation around um, how do those social networks work and um, what is the sort of the effect of participating in those social networks through PMI um, overall on people's ongoing engagement um, and uh, perhaps on their behaviors and with health outcomes. We certainly know that there are a gazillion mobile health devices out there and fitness-related uh, devices. <clears throat> we don't really know what impact they have on individuals' health outcomes over the long term. Um, and similarly, we know um, some about people's participation in social networks and health-related social networks, but being able to do this at scale uh, should provide some really interesting information. And um, so we hope to explore that, but we, um, we're looking at the good ideas that are, are being brought in by our uh, applicants and the best brains um, who are coming uh, to be our partners. So we'll learn more about that as we go. Uh, 
a lot of people, Kathy, including me, are uh, un understandably curious about how they can volunteer. So you touched on that, but will there be a portal or a website uh, uh, that they will be able to just uh, uh, sign up? How will that work? So um, that's a great question. And in some ways, the direct volunteer uh, program is going to help us with that. The pilot program is going to help us think through that. So I think what we're going to do with the direct volunteers is explore the portal uh, and how to build it so that uh, people will be engaged and um, learn how to do that with a controlled audience. And then the question that you're asking is then how do you scale? And uh, how do you do a, um, a real launch of open uh, the ability of anyone to be able to, to, to participate. And this raises all sorts of interesting questions about um, whether or not there are campaigns within specific communities that would um, you know, flood the, the Precision Medicine Initiative with certain kinds of people. Um, so we have to think carefully about if, if we really are going to reflect the rich diversity of the United States, we need to think carefully about that outreach and engagement. And so we are uh, asking, uh, we have asked for help with that uh, through a communications and engagement solicitation, and we're going to uh, make that award uh, this week. And uh, those folks are going to help us figure out how to do this in a, um, a, a, a careful and successful way. And as we do this, we need to make sure that we are uber transparent about expectations, both on expectations about what will we need from you as a participant uh, if you're going to sign up to a, a volunteer, and what can you expect to get back, and importantly, what do we think we will learn from the cohort. And I think having sort of uh, uh, expectations set appropriately and realistically across all of the ecosystem, the um, researchers, the healthcare providers, and the participants is going to be super critical at the get-go so that people don't end up being uh, disappointed or uh, annoyed or um, feel let down <clears throat> from this, uh, from this uh, uh, undertaking. Back to you, Kevin. You need to make sure you still have a voice for the uh, big announcement tomorrow. So let's just uh, a rapid fire, uh, Kathy, just a, a quickly go through a few uh, more questions from the audience here in the next five minutes or so. Um, just back to the uh, direct volunteers, have you uh, thought about using Facebook or other social media uh, to recruit tools, either in this first phase or perhaps as you scale up? Back to you. So um, we do want to use social media to recruit, but I think we're probably not going to do that in this very first phase with the um, pilots. And the reason for that is um, if, if uh, sort of my pulse taking is any indication is that there's an enormous amount of enthusiasm. And so if we said for the pilots that we were going to have a wide open um, opportunity to participate, I think we would have uh, thousands, if not tens of thousands of people signed up in about five minutes. So um, in the volunteer, uh, direct volunteer pilot phase, which will last for a year, um, uh, we, will, we will have a con sort of controlled access into the program. Um, when we launch the direct volunteer program, we'll segue from the, the pilots into the uh, full-scale launch. Um, during the course of the pilot program, we're really going to have to map out the ways in which we reach out to people uh, through social media, uh, through community organizations. Um, uh, some of this is going to have to be, I think, pretty grassroots if we're really going to reach uh, people in every nook and cranny across, across the country. Back to you, Kevin. Uh, Kent uh, Lloyd has not read such a question as a statement, but I'm curious if you have any reaction to it. Um, perhaps it's not relevant, but it's interesting nonetheless. The direct volunteer pilot, he says, 
it is an opportunity to include the uninsured uh, and to direct them to obtain coverage through the Affordable Care Act, uh, a way to leverage the impact of the, of the Precision Medicine Initiative cohort program with increasing health care coverage across the nation. Has there been any thought to potentially linking those two elements? Back to you, Kathy. So I have to say that the way in which we have thought about um, the launch of the Affordable Care Act and um, and uh, um, the getting people enrolled in um, healthcare programs has been more related to the unsuccessful initial launch of that program and what can we learn about what kind of um, uh, processes we need to put in place to kick the tires to make sure that we um, have the capability, the user-focused design, that we have everything, all the bugs worked out uh, before we go live. Um, so that's the way in which we've thought about it most. The, the issue here, though, is really important. So for people who are um, uninsured or underinsured, if they are uh, volunteering into this cohort, we need to think very carefully about what responsibilities and obligations um, ethically we have to those participants if they have themselves health conditions when they walk in the door uh, or log on, and if those uh, indicators, biomarkers, uh, signs or symptoms of disorders are identified in the course of the program. So for people in the HBOs, in the healthcare provider organizations, that's presumably not an issue. But for direct volunteers, this is a substantial issue, um, one in which we are um, eager to have robust conversations and discussions with all of you and uh, with the people who are participating in the pilot, the direct volunteer pilot. I don't think we have yet uh, an adequate answer, and we certainly will have to have a very adequate, more than adequate answer before we go uh, live in large scale direct volunteer program. Kevin? Thanks, Kathy. Do you see epigenetics being part of the Precision Medicine Initiative? Back to you. Absolutely, although again, um, like uh, the genomic analysis, I think we're going to wait a little bit of time before we deploy that into the cohort, but for a couple reasons, some pragmatic and, and, well, all pragmatic. So we need to build a biobank before we can collect biospecimens and before we can do analysis of biospecimens. So there's that uh, sort of built-in lag, and we want to understand uh, in exquisite detail what the participants in the cohort um, are interested in having done uh, done with their specimens and how they want that information back. And so we need to figure that out before we can think about doing um, epigenomics in the, in the cohort. I should also say quickly that there will be core um, data collection through the cohort and core laboratory analyses performed within the cohort. And then there will be the opportunity to use this as a platform for many, many, many other studies. And you could imagine all sorts of ways in which you could use a national cohort of a million or more people uh, to advance science. So it could be the basis of recruiting a sub-cohort of people who have uh, specific phenotypes or genotypes that you want. Um, to uh, engage in a specific clinical trial, for example. Um, you might want to uh, gain access to biospecimens from individuals with specific characteristics. All of those things will be possible because our participants as our partners uh, will have provided or can provide, because we're in ongoing contact with them, their permission to participate in sub-studies or entirely new studies based on um, their interest or some other uh, characteristic about them. So I think that's one of the really exciting things. And we're hoping, you know, this is a disease agnostic um, research cohort. So, so all of the institutes and centers at the, at the National Institutes of Health are interested and uh, enthusiastic about this cohort. And over time, as we get it built, we hope that they will 
provide funding through their own mechanisms for researchers and their research communities to do studies um, that leverage and make use of uh, this national research cohort. Kevin? Thanks, Kathy. I'm going to sneak in one more question, and then you can you can sign off and uh, with any final thoughts, as they say in the debates, and uh, and I'll wrap up. Um, uh, earlier this morning, uh, earlier today, uh, at the Precision Medicine virtual event here, we uh, we heard from Tim Hubbard from Genomics England, and uh, obviously, particularly in Europe and some other places, uh, there have been efforts over a number of years now. Uh, in biobanking and uh, uh, genomic repositories of uh, small nations that arguably have uh, blazed a trail that we are belatedly following over here. I'm just curious if you could say a little bit more about how much you're collaborating and learning from some of these trailblazing efforts in not just the UK, but Estonia and Iceland, uh, um, which of course grappled with questions such as genomic privacy, for example. Back to you. So that's a great question, and we certainly do want to learn from all those uh, trailblazers who have gone before us. Um, although we do think that we are different and distinct, uh, unique, and um, awesome. But we, uh, for example, uh, had as one of our PMI working group members, Roy Collins, who is the um, head of the UK Biobank. Uh, different in its design, it recruited people who were 40 to 69, I think, uh, with the anticipation that you would have a higher number of individuals who had diseases that you were interested in, and therefore you'd have more power to study individual diseases um, earlier on. We're not going to take exactly that approach. Uh, we have, um, in the process of building the program, have looked very carefully at what has been done with other cohorts around the world, and we want to figure out ways in which to stay engaged with those cohorts over time. So that's going to be uh, an interesting and exciting aspect of this. The other um, thing is that where there are existing instruments uh, or um, uh, analyses that have been done usefully in other cohorts, we certainly want to be able to adopt those. So, for example, the Million Veterans Program, the UK Biobank, and others have ask people questions, and so to the extent that we can collect data that is comparable to the data that have been collected in other cohorts, that would be fantastic and powerful. Um, and then there are also small cohorts. Um, like uh, Google Baseline, for example, which are much deeper than our cohort is. And to the extent that there are interesting um, assays or interesting tools that they use or develop in the course of those smaller cohorts that are uh, validated within those cohorts, we might then import those over time. So I think we really need to learn from others, both large uh, cohorts, large and small. This sounds a little bit like Dr. Seuss. Um, Kevin, back to you. Okay, well, Kathy, that will have to be the last word. Um, I won't send it back to you for final thoughts uh, because of the, 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 the time lag, but thank you so much on behalf of everybody tuning in, uh, both live now and uh, on demand. Uh, there'll be many, many more, I've no doubt. And we look forward to uh, your big announcement uh, tomorrow. We're glad to have had this sneak peek. Um, that was Kathy Hudson, our second keynote speaker at the inaugural Precision Medicine uh, virtual event uh, hosted by LabRoots and the CNN Media Group. Uh, she's dire Deputy Director for Science, Outreach and Policy and a Chief Architect of the Precision Medicine Initiative. So uh, you've heard it all here. Uh, you can follow her on uh, Twitter at uh, Kathy Hudson NIH. Uh, she plugged her Twitter account several times and so if we didn't have time to get to your questions, um, I'm sure she won't mind if you uh, ping her uh, on Twitter, and I'm sure she'll try to uh, get back to you as time allows. Um, today's webcast is on demand, available on demand for another six months uh, through August of 2016, and uh, we'll let you know when that's, uh, that's available. I just want to finally, uh, in closing, thank uh, all the folks at LabRoots uh, for making this uh, platform work so well, and our sponsors in particular, um, Horizon Technology, Kyogen, Somalogic, Illumina, Reespro, and Helmer. Uh, they've made this event possible. Please go visit them in the exhibit uh, hall uh, and see what, what, uh, how they're engaging with the precision medicine uh, community. Please stay tuned uh, for another great talk at the top of the hour. 
uh, when we'll hear from Aya Khalil, uh, my friend uh, and founder of GNS Healthcare uh, up in Boston, um, a brilliant speaker, uh, and many more speakers to come. So on behalf of everybody involved in the inaugural virtual uh, symposium on pre precision medicine, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, I'm Kevin Davis for CNN. Uh, we appreciate you joining us, and bye-bye uh, for now.